The Sweet 16 is upon us, and back again is the great Brian Geisinger to talk about the no good, overrated, disintegrating, <laughs> washed ACC that has sent four more teams to the Sweet 16 the second weekend. Welcome to Chucking Darts, a podcast of informed, rigorous, reckless, harmless, speculative, and fun predictions about the game we love. And you can call me Chuck. This is episode number 198. The last episode I did was uh, like a bonus solo episode last week that actually was because Brian and I couldn't line up a time to do our tournament preview. Uh, and so I just talked about, you know, uh, I talked about the Colorado prospects. That was the good part of that episode uh, with Cody Williams, Tristan De Silva and KJ Simpson. Hopefully good. The rest of it was guaranteed <laughs> trash because I talked about my bracket, which was trash yeah <laughs> i don't need to perform a funeral about that but um regardless brian the great brian geisinger at bgeis underscore bird uh a contributor for forbes but has been in a bunch of different uh places over the last couple of years covering the acc he is legitimately the best to do it he is a return guest uh he was on last year to talk about uh, the Miami Hurricanes a lot over the course of the tournament because they made their final four run. He came on a couple times to talk about them, as well as Derek Lively, uh, who at the time was not a consensus lottery pick, uh, but who we both liked a great deal. And now we are going to dip into the ACC again because <laughs> no matter who wants <laughs> them to go away, they just don't go away. So, Brian, welcome back. How are you? I'm doing very well. Uh, the last time I was on with you, I believe, was like the first or second week of the season. So it's good that we can uh, we can bookend this thing here. And um, and yeah, those were good times late last season. Talking Luka Poplar, Derek Lively, and uh, Basky Jordan Miller. Lee. Yeah, Jordan. I was gonna say. Yeah, I was gonna give him like a longer title, but yes, Jordan Miller's uh, awesomeness. Uh, those were those were good good times. More simple times. I enjoyed it. You see what Jordan's doing in the G League? Have you followed that at all this year? I, I like occasionally it pops up. He seems to be like, so I guess, no, I have not. Honestly, but I assume, I assume he's playing basketball and playing it well somewhere. Uh, <laughs> feels like it's not going out on much of a limb for him. That's not, but you don't need to. That's what's great. That's yeah. what's great about talking about the ACC or its graduates in general is that expectations nationally are so low that when I say that someone's playing well, the listener will be like, Oh, well, good for the ACC. Yeah. But yes. Jordan is playing quite well in the G league. And I, uh, cautiously I'm optimistic that he will be a rotation member for the Clippers next season. Yeah. I, I, I what a would, lovely player. Yeah. Would love that. He's awesome. We, we're, we don't need to get into Miami talk, but like, you know, their season never really got off the ground. I think injuries derailed it. But like, man, they just they missed Isaiah Wong and Jordan Miller. They like they lost two. They the roster has great players on it, but they lost two like amazing college basketball players and uh yep. didn't quite replace the like perfect like small ball forward game of Miller and just like the crafty shot making of uh, of Isaiah Wong. And I thought that uh I thought Norchad Omir played uh, like when I watched him, he he was out of position a lot more than I would have ever thought that he was. Mm -hmm. And they asked him to do a lot. And I guess he was partially overtaxed, but it was just a very it, it just seemed like a disjointed team, like a really yeah. Yeah. unfortunately underachieving group this year. But Jordan's great. And Isaiah was ACC player of the year. So that's what happens when you take that talent off a team. Um, but on to this tournament, five ACC teams entered. Uh, Virginia, with a, 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 a large degree of controversy, yeah. uh, they left very quickly, but ACC shook that off. NC State going through Texas Tech, a Final Four pick of mine, but I said that first game would be hard, so yeah. I, I feel somewhat vindicated. And uh, going through them in Oakland, Oakland in a thriller, uh, Clemson going through New Mexico and Baylor, who at least I was skeptical of Baylor. Clemson I took was, care of them. I, I was actually like Clemson. Once they got to, to Baylor, I was like, I think I was like, I think they're going to, I picked them. I picked them to, to beat Baylor. I was like, yeah, I felt pretty good about it, actually. 
we'll we'll talk about them when we get to them but i felt the same way once they played as well as they did against uh new mexico state i was like oh this and it, like it it wasn't just us i mean there were the people yeah. covering the game were like i actually think clemson might find itself in a good spot here um and then unc and duke i mean duke played they beat who they played they played two double digit seeds but they took care of them convincingly mm -hmm. um and then unc got tested a little bit by michigan state but went on a nice run after about the first 10 minutes and put some distance between them and they find themselves in a matchup with alabama which should be you know a fireworks factory so uh the the highest profile game should be duke in houston i would think just given duke's pedigree and given houston's you know status as the number one overall seed in the tournament um or maybe uconn is but houston's been the number one team in the country number one defense in the country for um the last several weeks and i know that you've covered this in depth you've actually covered it on another podcast um earlier this evening before recording with me but uh talking off mic before we you know hit record we both i think see this game similarly we think it will be a a very steep climb for Duke to beat this Houston team. So what is it about the matchup in particular that you think uh, favors Houston so much? And what do you think Duke might be able to do? Like what chances will they have to try to puncture that top rated defense? Yeah, there's a lot of interesting angles for this matchup. I think it's pretty, pretty fascinating. Um, given there is some versatility, obviously, obviously, to Houston's defense, but but what it's known for is their their ability to like pressure the ball, right? Mm -hmm. That starts with incredible point of attack defense, maybe the best point of attack defender in the country, or he's right up there. Uh, and Jamal Shedd with with guys like Reese Beekman. There's some other names we could throw out there, but also what their front four guys do guarding ball screens, right? What mm -hmm. their ability to um blitz screens and be above the level and to not just like hard hedge but like hard hedge with like intent to do damage <laughs> like to yeah. really disrupt and then just seeing all of their guards are so trained to do that little like um two hand like a uh, beach volleyball style like leap where they might try to deflect your they get a lot of steals and deflections that way if your point guard's gonna try like skip it over the top um I mean, the, the skips are there. So, uh, you know, Tyrese Proctor, who's not really like a, a paint touch guy, but can manipulate and can can throw skip passes over the top of the defense. Like maybe some of those reps are for, there for him. But I think this ends up being the case every time I think about a Duke matchup for a big game. And I it start, immediately starts with how does that other team defend screens? And then what does that mean for Kyle Filipowski? Of because course. and then like what can he do like it it should be the it should for me it's the top of the scouting report um because like there are some opportunities now houston's very good on the back side of those blitzes at sending an extra defender that if philip house he's going to pop someone's probably going to be like up there on him so can he get things going as a driver can he get things going as what's his court mapping what's his passing looking like What's the secondary movement? Are guys cutting? Can you can you find Mark Mitchell in the dunker? Can you find Jared McCain for kickout threes? Those have been his, you know, his primary like sort of like live ball passing reads this season. Um, and when they get to those empty corner looks, and if the rotations aren't there on the backside to close out on to, to flip, can he get can he get some pick and pop threes? Um, you know, it they're not obviously like Virginia and Houston are different defenses, but like Thinking about how Duke, how Philip House can be deployed in this game is sort of similar to how I think how he can be deployed against uh, Virginia too. Like there's some similarities to that. So the pick and pops, the short roll, the passing, the ability to just like build advantage in those pockets of space are huge. Um, can he find well, Jared and, McCain? And, and, is like and, the other thing too. Like that really does strike me as like the. What's the what's the off ball like zoned up backside coverage on Mark Mitchell? Like what are are they are they gonna try to like ignore him to to to, to flood help in other directions? And can you get like a big Jared McCain, you know, kick out shooting game? So that's where it starts. I mean, there's other ways to go, but like that's where it starts is like 
those two man actions with flip as the screener and what can you get to with him on the short roll or him in the pick and pop if Houston's blitzing these ball screens. And so I wanted to ask about blitzing the ball screens because, you know, with Duke, <clears throat> McCain, Roach, and Proctor all have had, I guess, their moments this year. McCain and Roach uh, more so than Tyrese. I think Tyrese probably had higher expectations of how this season would go for him personally by this point in the year. But they are not, I mean, none of them are super bursty off the dribble for like an instant paint touch. Roach is probably the best and most practiced at it, mm -hmm. but even he is not, you know, he's not just electric to the point where yeah. you have to make sure to put two on the ball. I know that Houston likes to play that way and they like to, you know, be very aggressive and ratchet up the pressure and turn you over. But do you think that Houston is going to commit very hard to blitzing that hard immediately to, to put themselves in rotation that intentionally to where they're going to, you know, to where Duke will have these pockets to try to take advantage of, or knowing that, you know, Duke can play three guards together, all of whom have, you know, pretty good passing vision and capability that they'll let it come. They'll sort of let the game come to them and challenge these Duke guards to try to make a little bit more happen on their own on an island against Houston's defenders. It, it's interesting because they can also like they can switch to like they've got like size guys, you know, in the front court room and in the, in the guard room. So like there's some switch, you know, versatility to them as well. Yeah, it's it's interesting to think about because like do you want to just go ahead and give these some of these automatic opportunities to Filipowski, right? I guess that's right. part of it. My guess is that like it's sort of like a statement type thing for them. And that, yes, my guess is that like, they've got it dialed up, but maybe you do want to like sort of keep that in your back pocket a little bit and try not to just like, you know, give flip the pick and pop or the short roll and the potential like kick out or the swing swing to Proctor or McCain, who, you know, McCain's a great shooter. Proctor's shot it well, um, some recently too. So I could see them maybe like take, like starting the game with a little bit more, like being like a little bit more reserved but my guess is that they'll, they'll come out pretty pretty odd and furious in this game and sort of just like try to establish and dictate the like the the tone and the um the feel of the game knowing that this is a duke team that's basically playing like six guys now i mean they're duke's duke is you no know, caleb foster mm -hmm. um they're 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 thin and, it, and like you know foster's had an okay not amazing freshman season but another six, four guard who can run pick and roll and shot 40% on threes in though he did not shoot a good percentage at the rim is willing to drive. And I think that's something that would be, would be a help, a helpful piece against a, a Houston defense that does foul a decent amount. Um, oh, this is going to be my next question. Yeah. It's about yeah. The fouling, but yeah, go ahead. Yeah. Go ahead. yeah. I think, I think that's part. So I guess that could also be another reason for why Houston maybe to not like run into two fouls on a key player early in the game as well. Like maybe they don't come out 110 miles per hour. Um, I mean, they've got some guys in the red team. I mean, they've, they've lost two very good players to injury, which is, uh, you know, pretty unfortunate. Um, two of their probably like, you know, higher upside players. Uh, so, you know, they're out there without, you know, some talent. But, um, but yeah, I, I do think they come out pretty, like, pretty, pretty furious, pretty ferociously against Duke uh, and try to like get Duke making mistakes and playing into turnovers and then having, you know, running it down their throat on the other side. And I mean, if there's a player, I mean, this is another thing is that if there's a player that can really force the issue with them physically to try to get them in foul trouble, I would imagine that it's either Filipowski himself or, you know, Mitchell off of cuts. Cause I mean, mm -hmm. those are the two most just pound for pound physically talented guys. Mm -hmm in the lineup and Filipowski, you know, relies so much on forcing contact anyway, that like, if there's any sort of game script where as it's unfolding, you can see things sort of falling at least uh, in, in a structure that Duke can take advantage of. It would have to be that Houston, you know, gets some ticky tack calls and that he gets mm -hmm. into a bit of a rhythm going to the line. I just, yeah. my concern is that, Filipowski just doesn't the way that he draws fouls uh, the way that he likes to draw fouls is through a lot of like brutal but 
effective force. I mean, a lot of it is not very pretty. He is not an expert um, manipulator. Even in the post, he's not much of a manipulator. Like his footwork's fine, mm -hmm. but he is not someone who is trying to wrong foot someone to create like a perfect layup. He is almost like he's going until he's comfortable and then he's going right through you. And mm -hmm. I just don't know that Houston is really the team to try that against. And I think yeah. that if, if, if that's what he does and I don't really know what else, you know, flip really has in his bag, then it's going to be a long night. And I think that he can adjust enough as a, a playmaker in the short role. Like you're saying, if the pockets are there, like he will, he will know to try to spray to shooters, but mm -hmm. all the same, it just, I don't know. I like, it's obviously reductive to say the shots have to go in and they need an outlier, you know, shooting night from mm -hmm. the, the guards who have a chance to do it. But even so, you know, Mark Mitchell's going to be out there and he's not going to get many up from three and he'll try to be cutting whenever he can. It just, I think the math is going to be very hard unless Proctor, McCain, and Roach all have just borderline like nuclear shooting nights from three is sort and, of and how they, I see it. And they can do that. Like that, they can. And I, and I do. And like there is the whatever percent chance that just like McCain is, you know, on a heater, right? Mm -hmm. And then all of a sudden he hits a bunch of threes and then that opens other stuff up. Yeah, I mean, I think like in those like short roll situations, you want Mitchell in the dunker spot as much as possible because when he's when he's spaced, it's just too easy for teams to ignore. You know, like they'll just let him have the the you know the spot up corner three or whatever. Um, and often, like they can close out on to it because he's got such like a low and slow developing shot, and he's not like a burner to catch and go too. So even if he got a hard closeout, it's not really like what he does best. Um, and so, yeah, I generally prefer him in the dunker and then you just space with Roach, Proctor and, and McCain and look if Sean Stewart's in and I could see him maybe having a role for Duke in this game, um, just given his athleticism and his physicality, like, you know, he's going to be in the dunker spot too. Um, Flip is really good on the short roll, but he has had some bad short roll games too. The Notre Dame game in Durham, um, like Notre Dame's coverage is, you know, they and they were mostly icing screens and, and weaking screens. And then he was catching in space. They were rotating another guy over. Uh, <laughs> I actually, after that game, I asked Micah Shrewsbury, like, what the approach was for guarding flip on the short roll. And he said, all, if he said something along the lines of all the other coaches can watch the film. I'm, I don't coach those other teams. He <laughs> did not have, he did not have time for my question. I was like, all right, very well. Um, I was interested, but, um, <laughs> So I, like, I think uh, there's that. I think the he's a great coach. He and is. Notre, Notre Dame's coming too. Like they're, I, I don't know if it's gonna be next season or two years, but like they're, I think they're coming. Oh, I um, think next year they'll be much improved. Yeah. I mean, they're much improved by the end of the year yeah. this year. Yeah, yeah, right. Great. They were a good defensive team. They've got some good freshmen. Uh, Marcus Burton should not have been freshman of the year in the ACC, but it's fine. Um, mm. I could see Duke trying to play through Phil Pawski in the post a little bit, like as physical and strong as Houston is, it is a shorter team. It is. Um, it, is it is a shorter team. And so, like, I mean, I don't know about Filipowski just, like, catching and, like, dominating scoring-wise from the block, but, like, can he get some fouls? Can he get – can he if he get, if they're doubling the post, you know, can he find the next pass? Can you get some – can you get two on the ball that way out of the post? Um, I think it's interesting to consider some inverted – screening actions for Duke in this game just so they can get a ball screen with a good playmaker but maybe instead of maybe it's not a hedge you know or like it's not a blitz or whatever if it's going to be if it's going to be LJ Cryer you know it's, if it's Jeremy Roach setting a screen for Filipowski you know are you what it, how is Houston going to defend that I'm curious mm -hmm. to see um I can see you know I can see Duke trying some 5-4 five, 4-5 four, four, five pick and roll with Mitchell and Filipowski those could be switches um though like that's that's that tends to be how teams cover that um yeah the inverted one i was thinking about as well i i don't know i haven't paid enough attention to mccain as a screener this year and how well i presume that he does pretty well with he, it he but. is actually mccain is actually a very good screener in my yeah I, in part because like he's you know he's got the trunks and also it, like he's a great <laughs> shooter too you know like he's uh he is like a fullback flying around out there but he's uh 
Yes, they actually have a couple of plays. They've got like a little like rip screen play for him where it's like, mm-hmm. it looks like they're running floppy action and he'll sort of like fake like he's coming out beyond a screen and sort of like stop, turn, and then just like smash the opposing center defender with a back screen and get mm-hmm. Filipowski or, or Young or Stewart, whomever, a layup. Um, they use him a decent amount as a screener. Like it's a pretty powerful, powerful tool for them. Um, and he's really good when they can sort of like play off of his gravity as a shooter to then because because again this one set it's like it looks a lot like a set that they used to get him a three and so they use that they they build off of it to have him set a back screen and try to steal a layup off of it um i think the other things too are like what can they get with mccain as like a movement guy in this matchup um he's a great movement shooter Mm -hmm. and they've been great all season running him off of flares usually they they because teams have been, you know, playing off of Mark Mitchell so frequently, like very early on, the tool for them became to counter that was like, well, if you've got a guy in the paint defending Mitchell when he's 20 feet out, then we're having that, we're having, we're thrown into the high post to Filipowski and then Jared's running to the left and, and uh, Mitchell's stepping up from the corner and he's setting a flare screen and we're getting threes mm-hmm. in the corner off that all. And like, they cooked off that. They got a three against James Madison on an after timeout against with that action, with one of those actions too. Um, so yeah, that's like I do think like the movement stuff with McCain is potentially like a big thing. And then like off of that, I think there's something to be said for all of the little other like wrinkles. Duke could potentially they have some veer packages, veer pin down sets for McCain. They've got uh, a back screen lob play out of a timeout where it's usually Sean Stewart, but like he'll run up, like he's going to set the ball screen. He'll veer out and then he'll run off of a back screen for a lob. Um, but, but like that stuff is sort of like a little bit more like specialty, like sort of like stuff. Yeah. You gotta, like set up, but you know, like ATO. Yeah. Up. yeah, exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, like, but you know, they can steal some points off that. I think that's like a, maybe a little, little interesting they, I thought they were going to be a team that got to like a lot of like split action and early this year against Arizona, the Dartmouth game, some of the other like November games, they did this a decent amount. They throw it to flip at the elbow or above the break or whatever. They'd have McCain and Proctor or McCain and Roach, you know, run towards each other and then kick off in different directions. And like, maybe that's something you can, you can get to, to try to get McCain some looks and then maybe flow into some, you know, ball See, screen opportunities too. The, the, stu- the stuff I worry about with that is that Houston is like all too eager to pursue off the ball and stay <laughs> attached. Like yeah, I, yeah, I, yeah. I, I, I like <laughs> the idea of leveraging McCain a lot in this matchup because if Houston is going to create these pockets of space by pressuring ball handlers so much, if you use McCain as a screener either for Filipowski or for another guard and they're not going to switch it right away, and they're going to allow this pocket pass, McCain, once he gets into space, is a good manipulator and will make sure to engage the big that's in the middle Mm -hmm. of the floor and make him commit one way or the other, and he will make the right decision. The issue for McCain is generating the space in the first place. But if Houston's going to gin that up for him, then he will be able to make some hay. And I mean, McCain... I've spoken about him as a draft prospect on um, Maxwell Baumbach's show, Draft Sickos. Um, but like one of the quickest triggers in the country, yeah, certainly among freshmen, just a really, really, really good shooter who can get very hot. I mean, I watched the game. I don't know if you watched the game where they played uh, Florida State where he had 35 yes, and he hit his first seven in or eight a flash. Threes. Yeah. Oh my flash. God. He was yeah. unconscious. And so like, it's the sort of thing where if Houston comes out all keyed up like that to make a statement in your in your estimation, then if Duke approaches it the right way and I think includes a lot of flip in the short roll and McCain as an inverted screener, they'll have a chance to just put points on the board. And then you hope that the fouls sort of fall the right way and yeah, that Houston yeah. sort of goes into one of their droughts. But let's talk about that because that the reason I have not picked Houston, um, you know, despite my trashy bracket, I did manage to pick UConn and win the national title. 
And I said the reason that I didn't think risky, was... <laughs> <laughs> risky move on your part. <laughs> hey, hey, what am I supposed to do? I, I mean, just... dude, they they are the best team. Like, let's be real. Like, they're, it's a, it's an incredible team. They're but but look, look, I mean, Houston was the consensus um, number one team in the country, even though UConn went thirty and three and was the defending national champion. And so I'm sure Houston, even among you know more hardcore followers of the game had their fans and picking them to go all the way. And I like in short, again, it's sort of a, a, a brutal but effective um, reason is that I don't trust their offense to be able to like consistently get to good, reliable looks, number one, over the course of six games for now. And number two, because despite how good their defense is and how, um, you know, well coached it is, they're prone to fouls, which that circus against AM exemplifies. You know, they were lucky to get out of that game considering how many free throws AM missed. And uh, because they don't have a ton of size, eventually they'll run into a team with a lot of size and skill that will challenge them to keep up. And mm-hmm. Duke isn't necessarily that team with Filipowski being really the only guy over six, six that can do anything, you know, operating on the ball really, but that weakness is out there. So how do you expect uh, Houston to perform against Duke's defense and how sort of, how soundly do you think Duke can stick to a game plan on that end? I'm going to take the second part first because I'm fat. That's really fascinating to me Um, against JMU. This happens in a, fair amount of their games where like they come out in the drop pretty early with Filipowski. They got him, Mm -hmm. you know, below the level. It's not a deep drop. They've mixed into the deep drop some this year. It's just like a pretty solid drop though. And then if things aren't like going great for them, all of a sudden they're just like, F it, let's switch, right? Let's just switch, keep the ball in front. Um, I feel, you know, that seems just like Houston's like, all right, let's just get a shot up on the glass and then we're going to try to mash them. And like, it's a great, you know, they're a good, it's a good offensive rebounding team. So like, I would be a little hesitant to just like immediately dive into, Oh yeah, let's switch Kyle Filipowski out on, on, on Houston's guards and just try to like hold down the fort on the glass and like not give up layups and pick up stupid fouls, you know, on like putbacks and stuff like that. So mm-hmm. I would, I mean, I suppose like the thing, one of the things they could try to do is like in that scenario is like, you could try to stick Stewart or Mitchell also, if you wanted to switch more, and keep Filipowski around the basket. You could try to have like, you know, Mitchell or Stewart guard primary, you know, screeners, you know what I mean? Have those mm-hmm. guys be the people switching, but like they've done that some this year, not, not a ton, but it's, it's in the, it's in the bag. Um, I don't feel super great about them, like committing to the scheme, like sticking to it all game. The win over Baylor way back in December is like maybe one of the best examples of that, where they beat it's, a big time opponent. Their, their best one of the year. And they just, and they, it was the first time they went to like a deeper drop. And it mm-hmm. was like, it was, it was noticeable because early in the year they had lit more up at the level. Um, and I didn't, I really didn't like, I just, in general, I'm not crazy about up at the level and just like, like if you're going to be up there, just blitz. Like, it's kind of, kind of, kind of how I feel generally. Well, especially because he's not the best, you know, athlete backpedaling right, anyway. Right. Exactly. So, yes, yeah. exactly. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So I think that's what they should try to do and see if you can like stuff Houston into taking some tough twos and keep your, you know, your tallest player, your best rebounder around the hoop. But I do worry that they're going to lose. Like at some point they're just, they, they could get like a little panicky and just decide that they're going to switch because like, that's sort of what they do when their backs up against it. Um, I think Jawan Roberts is like an interesting sort of like swing piece for Houston. This one too, just because like, you know, he can initiate from different spots on the floor. Like obviously like he's, that's not like a huge part of the offense, but the offense can morph and he can get to the handoff game. He can face up in the mid post that he can, you know, he'll set a cross screen for Francis and then he'll, you know, lift to the elbow and try to catch and face up. Um, I'm curious if he can be given them any sort of like, if he gives Houston any sort of secondary creation, like how does Mitchell most likely handle that? Or how does Sean Stewart handle that? If they're getting, if they're getting minutes um, or if they go to this other concept of having, 
you know, of, you know, uh, cross matching at the four five, you know, that might be Filipowski that's, you know, hit, you know, trying to guard him on the block. All of the, all of which is to say that like, regardless of like the scheme that they start with, what they switch to, what they finish with, how they handle the four five scenario, there is going to be a ton on Kyle Filipowski's plate, like on both ends of the court. Like that's true in pretty much every big game for them. But just like given the rebounding concerns, given how tough Houston makes it to finish at the rim um, on the other side of the floor with their ability to block shots, um, given the playmaking load that'll likely be on his plate, it just, it's just, they're going to need to, they just need, it's so obvious, I guess, but just like he's so needed to have a monster game. His best game, the best game of his career. Yeah, basically. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, exactly. So, but yeah, defensively, I, I, I'm not sure I see them like going with something and sticking to it for like 40 minutes. And that could even be with them, like, like them having it rolling because John Shire, I've literally talked with him about this. Like they do like to mix stuff up. They did it with Derek Lively last season. Um, Granted, it's, it's a different thing guarding ball screens with Lively as a screen defender than like any other freshman or college center because he's just special like that. Um, but that is part like Duke does want to be like versatile and sort of like give you different looks. Um, so I think that will happen, whether it's sort of like out of from like a position of strength or like kind of a, a position of weakness against Houston's pick and roll scheme. Mm. Yeah, I think like and I am a bit more tepid on we we both think that Houston is going to win this game when it comes down to it. And so and though we're acknowledging that. Duke has a chance. A lot has to go right, and they need some monster performances from their best players. That's mm-hmm. the case, you know, this time of year in the tournament for most teams. But I am more tepid on Filipowski as a pro prospect, and I said the same when you were on the show last time at the beginning of the year, that he <clears throat> he does not offer a ton as a center in the way of deterrence at the rim. I mean, he certainly doesn't deter people from trying him and when they try him you know really good practiced college guards the type you get at this point of the season a lot of them have success and a lot of bigs have success on him and have had success on him so in the theory behind him as a top 10 prospect in this year's draft is to me that he is more of just like a jumbo wing like a dribble pass shoot guy at 6'11", 7 foot, who has enough spacing to be able to play off of another big at the next level. And I have my issues with that. I don't really, I think that is more of a square peg round hole situation for Flip, but... He's just probably not like a starter, basically. You know what I mean? It might be well, a but if But if he's, but, a, if yeah. he's one of the 10 best players in the draft, even this draft, he probably is a starter. Because like, I would, yeah. I think that the 10 best players in this draft will be starters in the league. Mm -hmm. It's just a question of whether or not Filipowski is one of them. I don't think he is, but if he's going to be, then like the whole bag needs to be on display in this game. If he gets, you know, because Houston's a little undersized, even with their bigs, whenever he gets any sort of a mismatch, you know, if Emmanuel Sharp is, Sharp's not her, is he? Or is he? No, I think, no, he's been playing. Yeah, so if Emmanuel yeah. Sharp is switched on, I mean, Emmanuel's 6'4", then Flip, it's not, you don't turn and start backing him down from 25 feet out, though he could do that, <laughs> but yeah. that would allow Houston to reset and double him and all this stuff. He yeah. has to take him off the dribble the way that an NBA wing would get in, force help, and make the right decision or try to finish. And too frequently with Filipowski, when I watch him, he likes to default to that post game and you can, you can see the wheels turning in his head about um, how he is reacting to what the defense is doing rather than set the defense up. I said it earlier by saying he's not a manipulator. It's that way, both as a scorer and as a playmaker, he, he will make the pass that is right in front of him. If there is a strong side pass, to make where it's like a two-man game he can do that and that's fine but that i haven't seen much advanced from him in that area and houston is the type of team where if you not even hesitate but if you're just not ahead of them 
then their defense will rotate so well and so aggressively that before you know it, whatever advantage was there was gone and they're coming for the ball. So I just, that's my, my skepticism about Filipowski as an NBA wing who can do a little bit of everything. I think it's more like he can't quite do enough of anything, but that's the issue in this game is that I want, I would like to see his processing and his feel sort of out think and out quick Houston. And I just don't know that it will. I would love to be surprised though. That's sort of yeah. from a draft perspective. That's what I would like to see. Yeah. It's, it's, it, that's a tough, I mean, like it would be an incredible moment for him to really like rise to the occasion. Cause like he'll play well, like even in his bad games, he and like in college, he ends up, it ends up being like, Oh, he had, you know, 11 points, 10 rebounds, five assists. Like he, right. he, he right, stuffs right. the stat sheet. He gets steals and blocks too. But um, when you're a skilled guy who plays at center in a college program, you will get the yeah. opportunity to yeah. accumulate those stats. I mean, that's sure. how it goes. For yes. sure. Like, yeah. I mean, in, and like to your point, like it's been, there have been multiple like opposing coaches that I've heard after games this season that like they describe Flip as like a seven foot guard. Right. Because like he, mm -hmm. that is sort of like, that is kind of like how he functions. I think he's like, he's done pretty, like he's given a workload that few players in the country do. I really believe that. Like, because like he anchors the defense, he has to navigate mm -hmm. some games. He's doing four or five different pick and roll coverages. And then it's also like, you need to be the screen setter, the secondary playmaker, the post mm -hmm. hub the high post hub, they do more five out stuff this year. So you got to initiate all that. And we need you to hit threes and get to the line. Like it's just, he's asked to do everything. And he has that sort of like all court game. And they've like tailored the roster to an extent around him to do that. Once they didn't get, you know, once Lively went pro, they didn't get another, you know, uh, you know, sort of like run jump center in the, in the portal. Um, and I do think like, I, I don't, I think his passing is like I'm probably a little bit higher on his passing than you are. Um, I think I'm a little lower than most. Yeah. So I you're yeah. in the majority. Yeah. He's not he is not like over over you know, super manipulative, but like I've seen him like look guys off and then he'll you know he, he gets he moves a guy to think he's gonna kick it to the wing and then he flips it to Mitchell or Stewart in the dunker spot. Sometimes sure. those guys don't catch the pass, which is like you know, and he it's hard for him to hide his frustration. Um I think he'll be interesting in the NBA in a role that's like scaled down a little bit, both in terms of like role and responsibility on both sides of the court. Because I think the thing he does best, I, I, I kind of think that his best quality outside of just like his size and like, you know, a desire for contact and like, you know, that type of stuff. Um, I do think his, like, I think he, I would think he would do better in a role that allowed him to just sort of like be more of a ball mover like Duke, Duke needs him to like be a be a creator and a finisher, and I think at times like mm -hmm. he has struggled to like find the balance between those two things. It's probably why he isn't he's been awesome this year, but why he probably didn't have a ton of like complete like dominant forty minute games. Mm -hmm. And also they're at they, they've been they've been asking him to do a, a ton of stuff defensively. So like that is part of it as well. I think in a role where like you simplify it a little bit. Um, on both sides of the court then it allows him to sort of like he'll just become a little bit more efficient he'll like unlock different parts of his passing game with more spacing and which is sort of a role that allows him to he's just his, his passing options are a little limited and i think he's had to work around something that duke didn't plan for this year which was mark mitchell can't shoot threes anymore mm -hmm. and like this five out machine that they thought they built that they thought they were building they it it has worked, but not to the level that thought it was going to. And I think it's because while they I think they found some roads to like working around it, they have to problem solve around the fact that like it's harder for them to like space the floor and like open up lanes. You know what I mean? To to, to slash and kick and stuff like that. Um, and like as far as like Mitchell goes, Mark Mitchell really struggles to finish the contact and contests at the rim. If there were ever a game for him to sort of like reverse that reputation, sure, this would be a big like. It just, it just, it just would be very hard to do. But just like because like Houston makes everything tough at the rim, but just like he just needs to go in there with force and like if he gets blocked, so be it. But just try to get a dunk or two and get some fouls because like 
he's going to get a couple of those opportunities per game, and he's just got they've got to get something on those. This can't be, you know, Mark catches, he holds for a second and a half, he tries to like contort and finish instead of going up strong, and you know, it's a rebound and Houston's you know sprinting the other way. It can't be that. Like he's got to play with with serious force and like quickness, quickness catching the ball in space and trying to finish. Um, those I think I think again he's another sort of like highlight piece for Duke in this um in this matchup okay yeah anything anything else on this one i think uh if not we'll move on probably to unc alabama yeah that sounds good just the last thing i would say we didn't touch on him too much in the preview we talked about him maybe more when i came on in november and like we'll save this convert the full conversation for another day i just i want to get this in because i've gone i've talked about this in a few other spaces this season like I think Tyrese Proctor has had a good season. Mm-hmm. I think he's largely been very similar to what he was last season. I still think he's an NBA player. I'm not sure he should go pro this year. I'm not, I'm not hundred percent sure. Um, I still think he does some things very well. I think he, he shoots it just enough. I wish he could get downhill more. He doesn't really do that. I love his connective passing. I love the transition mm-hmm. passing. Those are like the highlights to his game, but like, that's probably not like just, you need to be a great defender to like really like have that like seeing as you're like you're defining offensive traits or whatever. And I don't, I mean, he's an okay, not great defender. Um, I think he was a bit of like a lively merchant last season to an extent on mm-hmm. that side of the floor. Um, I mean, look, Tyrese has a three to one assist to turnover yeah. ratio, which for someone who does not live in the paint is ridiculous. Yeah. Cause normally yeah. you would think you'd be generating those windows and, you know, making easy yeah. passes. For someone whose average pass has a pro or average assist, I should say, has a higher degree of difficulty, you know, that that's a ridiculous ratio. It's yeah. it truly is. But yeah, and go ahead. So, and so the, the I say all of this to get to the point, which was that, and this is something you and I talked about in November, man, which was it's it's like a little unfair the expectations that got thrust on him coming into the season, which mm-hmm. was that like all of a sudden Jonathan Gavoni mocks him seven. And I remember you and I talked about this and then we were like, like, I remember I, that. I'm no, a Proctor yeah. guy. And I was like, <laughs> that, that, that mock draft went up and alarm bells just started ringing in my head. And I was like, wait a second. Like I thought I was in like the 99th percentile of like Proctor fans. And I was like, well, hold on. <laughs> that is, that's much too high for a guard who like doesn't touch the, you know, doesn't get to the paint, like that kind of stuff. And um, yeah, I just think that's... he got all of a sudden he got, it just like, everyone all of a sudden was like, Oh, he's a lottery pick. And it was, he's played pretty well this season. He's dealt with a pretty serious ankle injury, came back Mm -hmm. and has played well from that. But just like everyone was expecting him to like make a huge jump this season. And that was based off almost nothing. And he's still, still, still 19, right? Yeah. Cause he, cause he reclassed to come in early last season. Yeah. So he turns 20, I think in April or May and, you know, he shoots 54% from two on enough attempts and, you know, 10 threes per 100. He's made almost 60 threes and had the ankle injury. Yeah, yeah. look, I... Fine player, he's fine. He's he fine. is a fine, but I, I would agree. Yeah. I think the the issue with him is that I do not consider him enough of a physical talent to mm-hmm. return yes. the value on defense. That's really the problem. I mean, th- and that's evident in his lack of paint touches, but, you know, you because he's not i mean it's a pretty simple formula if you're not a top three arguably and certainly not a top two option in the nba then so much is going to be asked of you defensively to make up the you know the responsibility that's vacated by the stars who are taking care of the offense you know as number one and number two options and i don't know where proctor falls within that if you want to believe in some physical development that's going to come down the road, then sure. But like, do you even think that he's going to go pro after this year? Or do you think he's going to, you know, play as a 20 year old, still young with Cooper flag next year and go that route? I think there's, he's one of a couple of guys who, I mean, at this point it does feel like McCain's probably more likely to bounce because he's had a great season and it's a weaker draft. And like he could, you know, he's, back end lottery or you know middle of the first round somewhere in that range i kind of think proctor should come back um but it depends on his patience level um like he he may want to just bounce and like 
I don't know if that's a great idea. Um, I think it, it could behoove him to come back and just like, I kind of think the thing for him is to just to like really make a jump as a shooter. Like he needs to get stronger. That'll help his defense. And just like, he's already an okay shooter, but is there like another tier to get to in terms of like the pull up shot? Can you, can, can you start to like geek out defenses a little bit more, you know, in those sort of like live ball shooting situations to force team to maybe come up closer to the level. And then he can turn the corner or get the rolling as a passer. So um, I, I just don't have a good feel for it, but I would not at this point, nothing would surprise me versus like stay or, yeah. or, uh, Look, or leave. Another thing about this draft, which everyone I think is still pretty clueless about. And I'm not saying that like, I am clued in and everyone is, is trailing me. I am as clueless as everyone. But, but another consequence of that is that like workouts will be very important, you know, in the, in determining whose stock goes where between now and June. So if Tyrese tests the waters and shoots really well in workouts, or if he's in three on threes and his passing vision really, starts to pop which it, it certainly could then you could see then all it takes is mr gavoni to say you know like yeah. oh i'm here in top 20 and then there yeah. you go he's back in the draft and we're yeah. good yeah and it just yeah. it comes full circle so yeah, yeah i think that a lot of it is still very much on the table for him because of the archetype questions for him i can't like to me it's let let some other team reap those rewards like by all means just because the the odds are sort of against it working for a non-elite athlete who uh is not really a three-level scorer yet but stranger things have happened i mean for sure um and he still shot you know he didn't really get to the rim but he shot 61 percent at the rim which is fine and 46 percent sort of in mid-range which is good i mean the yeah. attempts were low but the touch is there so the stranger things have happened yeah. there are there are worse packages to have to offer that is pro- like in terms of just his profile and his age his productivity level his competition level i mean probably a top 40 guy but that you know that's compelling for some people and not for others so yeah i mean that, yeah. that's where it's at yeah um all right you want to do unc and and bama yeah let's do it okay so uh talk to me about unc as uh sort of dictating the terms of engagement in this matchup because given their experience level particularly on the front line you know through baycott i would expect them to have like a real physical advantage. You know, Alabama has some guys who are tough, but no one really, you know, they don't have Betty Yako back there to really battle and just match size for size. And I would expect that RJ Davis would, you know, and just how UNC schemes everything up, they would have enough to get Baycott involved enough to really put Alabama on their back foot. So that's sort of what I see. I, think that unc will win this game i'll just say but tell me what you're seeing starting in the front court and how you expect things to play out yeah that's a the like baycott nelson matchup is pretty fascinating um yeah you know can you can you get you know nelson is a guy that does commit a fair amount of fouls um you know baycott is a guy that draws a fair amount of fouls they they run like actions to like put like they you think Baycott has what, like thirty pounds on him? It, yeah, like, he's a, I, yeah, he's a he's a total tank, and he loves yeah. contact. And like, he's got like I don't think he has like moves per se, but he's got like just enough like footwork and like guile to his game too. Like he's a brute, but like there is some craft to it. And like they run very good stuff to get him looks. It's and it's sort of like less traditional like UNC like high low action and more mm-hmm, like mm-hmm. cross screen. We're gonna punch it into you or back screen. We're gonna punch it into you, slice screen, just like, but like they have actions, including one like almost like double back screen look to try to like get him down to the left block. That's, you know, he sets up there a lot. Um, he's an okay passer out of the post, but like he's looking to score when he gets it down there. Especially in this matchup. Yeah. 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 And he should, and he should. Um, and so I do think in like figuring out like how you're setting those up and what the spacing is around those is crucial which that starts with like, where's RJ Davis? Then it goes to like, where's Harrison Ingram kind of, 
And like, is Elliot Godot out there? Because like, I mean, we can get to Godot, but just like, that is something for UNC to problem solve around too. Just like how teams are going to guard Godot. How do you handle that? Um, I also think Baycott, not to just like flip the script here, but I think I'm fascinated to see UNC, which is this drop coverage team, right? Like they are similar to like Baylor or Purdue. Um, they are they are so disciplined with their desire to play drop coverage. They go under there, they want to like also ice ball screens on the side or weak screens that they can like push you to your left or your right hand, depending on your handedness. Um, and I'll be curious to see like what Alabama has cooked up for that. Not just in terms of like spread pick and roll and how what shots they're like willing to take, because like Alabama doesn't want to take mid-range twos, right? And UNC is trying to like stuff you into that. And so, like, I'm curious to see, like, how Mark Sears – I'm, I'm bouncing around here, so forgive me, but just, like – No, this is I, good. Sears is a guy who, you know, Alabama's got all these creative actions, these throwback screens, and, like, stuff that's designed to take advantage of drop coverage, but from a movement perspective, right? And so I think Sears is a huge piece of this. I imagine poor Mac Ryan gets that assignment – uh, and you know, he's the guy that's trying to chase him off screens and deny him off ball, like that type of stuff. He's probably, I mean, he's UNC's best like, you know, guard defender. Um, but that to me is sort of like a big thing. And then like if UNC, if Alabama hits enough shots to get them out of the drop coverage, because that's happened at times this season, well then can Baycott, like are you really willing to switch him out on Bama's guards? Like what does that look like? Because like that's been there – when they get pushed out of drop coverage, it turns into a switch fest for them. At least that's like what they try to have it be with with uh, with Baycott. So, um, to me, what do the post ups look like for Baycott? Where is he? Where are those catches coming from? What's the spacing look like? What are Alabama's coverages against that? Do they double? Uh, are they do they guard it straight up? And then on the other side, I just think Baycott in the drop, like and if if he's able to like hold the paint down. If Bama can't make shots, then he can just sit in that paint all day and, mm -hmm. and gum stuff up. Or does UNC have to mix stuff up if Bama's all of a sudden they're hitting, you know, pin down threes that are attacking the drop coverage and using that like negative space to to kind of shake some guys loose for uh, catch and shoot bombs? Well, do you, how do you expect RJ to do just on Sears in trying to get over screens to begin with? Yeah, I mean, he's okay. He's not bad at it. Like, I mean, the UNC's defense this season has been has been impressive to watch because it's like they very much so are like better than the sum of its parts, right? Like, there's mm -hmm. no, I mean, Baycott was voted voted first team all defense in the in the conference. I I didn't feel like I just, I mean I I got it because it's like they're the best defense in the conference. He anchored it. So like, no huge gripes, but just like yeah. That really is just they were like who had the most block shots in rebounds, you know, on this on the number one defense. It's it's fine, but like they're they bought into the scheme that has become like pretty in vogue, like in college basketball, like drop coverage. But you've got it to get it to work. You have to have guards to navigate screens, and so I could see at times like you know big a lot of stuff being put on RJ's plate. But I could also, like, they have Cormac Ryan and they have Seth Trimble off the bench, who is another, like, hyper-athlete, you know, like, rangy, you know, com no, he's not a combo guard. Really is, like, a true, like, sort of, like, two-guard wing. Um, both those guys are very aggressive denying off the ball, and they're good at navigating screens and their pests. And they're not, like, they've got size, too, and athleticism. So, like, my guess is that those guys will, will be deployed heavily in that matchup and you'll try to like move RJ to a less threatening perimeter assignment. But do you have a sense for in Alabama's case specifically who that's going to be? Because I mean, at <laughs> minimum, at minimum, yeah. like if that, if, if they try to hide him or whatever, if they get enough penetration and his assignment gets the ball, like at minimum, they're going to get a like a pretty uncontested three look, just given RJ's size. And if not that, they'll be able to blow by him and get into the paint. So, like, what do you think it's that simple that, like, oh, we'll hide him and he'll be fine and not very exploitable? I think, I mean, it teams have not been able to, like, really pick on him all that much this season. It has not been, like, a huge... 
it's not been like a huge issue for them. Um, in part because they've got so much other focus in the paint. And my, mm -hmm. they're probably thinking, well, if you want to go one on one at him, it's fine. I think from Alabama's perspective, it makes sense to go at him because it's like if you can pick up a cheap foul or you can wear on him a little bit because he's got such a creation load offensively. Like maybe you try to stick him on right cell, who's a you know a lower you he's a great player, but is like a lower usage guard. Um, so like there's maybe some sort of like hiding places for him, but he does guard. He's just limited because of his size and because like mm -hmm. he's asked to do so much offensively, you know. Um, but I think at this stage, like his defense will be like a much bigger concern for him, like beyond whatever happens after college basketball for him. And I guess he could be back next year too, but just like, I think defensively, like he's passable in this, in this scheme. And if you want to like break out, break away from this beautiful Alabama, you know, high octane, you know, spacing offense to, to, to try to like pick at someone one-on-one, -on -one, like, my guess is UNC would be all right with that. And then they're going to look to, oh, to push sure. Run, you know? Sure. Yeah. But that, I mean, Alabama is so hardwired. I mean, I, yeah, I, I don't expect that to be the case. Do you think, yeah. how do you favor UNC in this game? Do you see it as a toss up? Like ultimately, what are you, what matchup do you think will actually, you think the Baycott matchup will tilt UNC's way enough so that that is sort of where you are staking your pick or what do you think? I am, to me, it feels like a coin toss, but mm. it feels like a little bit more of a coin toss. I do give UNC a very, if I had to like pick a winner, I would say UNC. Um, but the thing that I'm like most interested on is like UNC's, this is maybe like, is, is the screen navigation from UNC. Like that mm -hmm. to me is like, like, can those guys stay out of foul trouble and can they do a good job in rear view pursuit? like navigating screens and contesting in that way, like pushing Alabama's guys off the line. Like, can they get to any of that sort of stuff? Um, how does Alabama counter that? Like that to me is like, whomever wins that matchup has like the edge. That to me is the thing that like, I'm sort of watching. I think probably most, um, but obviously like, yeah, Baycott dominates the paint. Then certainly that like, Alabama has to like commit resources to like stopping him, right? Because he's such a high usage guy who can also bang on the glass and draw fouls. So like if he gets rolling, then you and C can play downhill way more than they're probably like set to do and with like in terms of like what their like guard personnel looks like. I think Harrison Ingram is like, you know, kind of like he is a huge swing piece for them. Um when when Harrison Ingram shows up and plays well, hits his threes. Gives them another like larger guy that could initiate some from the post and out of the wing room. They're different when he doesn't show up against like he did against NC State in the title game where Mo Diara takes him out. Mm -hmm. um, and he can't when he gets to switch against the guard, he can't even get like a good look off. Like he 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 was bad. He was bad in the title game. He, he was it was kind of like an, I mean he had a couple of like wide open threes, but like other than that, he he did nothing in terms of like creating with the ball and like. They needed his scoring desperately. So he's a big swing piece for me. Baycott in the paint. And then, yeah, I would say like the navigation, screen navigations from like UNC's, like especially Ryan, Cadeau, and, uh, and Trimble when he's called into action. Do, do you have any sense about anything in the matchup that, that uh, swings Ingram one direction or the other? Or is it almost just like you have to see how he performs the first few minutes of the game? There, there he's a, an odd player. I mean, I, he, he's weird. Go, go ahead. Yeah, he's weird. He's yeah. weird. I do think it like, I mean, there's, it's like twofold for me because one is like, kid, does he hit like the open, like spot up threes and like, he did, he shot pretty well this year. He's not like a, he's not, by no means is he like a sniper, but just like by virtue of getting to play off of Davis and Baycott, he gets some good looks. Mm -hmm. Um, or there was parts of the season where I was like, man, when he can get like, when he can get switched on to like a small guard and then he can get to that like mid post game. It's it, to me, it's not like great offense, but like, he's pretty good at doing it. And that that's at least what he liked to do at Stanford all the time. And, and it's what it does now. They've got some sets. They've got like a little like horn set where he like, he pops out from the elbow to the wing. RJ lifts up from the corner and they try to get a switch. And you could see and during some of the matchups against state, 
state was like, we're just not going to switch that anymore. We're going to, we're going to like, we're going to go under the screen. We don't think you can beat us that way. And they're going to have, we're going to have the four pop out on the other side and be ready to guard you. Cause like you, you're not going to be able to post up with that, that guy, like you can uh, on a six, one guard or whatever. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, even if you've got some strength against a guy like Diara or whatever, like his length bothers, bothers Ingram. So like, I do think it's sort of like what matchups can he get switched into and then how well does he play out of those? And then it just sort of comes down to like, how does he do on like the, the catch and shoot shots? Because like though he'll, he ends up stumbling into some of those and they need him to hit that when like teams commit resources to Davis or to Baycott. And then when he's spotted up on the weak side wing and he's wide open, like if he gets four of those, does he make two or does he make zero? That's um, what I mean. Like, you know, right. Like, yeah, it's tough. But as far as like the on ball stuff goes, it's like Kenny gets switches. It's like really what it comes down to for me because like all the other interior stuff is like scavenger stuff. It's like transition. It's um, it's putbacks. It's like it's like that kind of like dirty work buckets, which is like, useful. It's just like it's tough to account for from like a creation standpoint. Mm -hmm. I would think that in this particular matchup, uh, his his work inside the arc and trying to manufacture those switches is not going to be terribly useful just because you would, the simple answer is just to get the ball to Baycott to begin with and make Alabama take that away. So if you are committing a, you know, extended post touch to someone who <laughs> isn't Baycott, then you're yeah. really sort of, yeah. you know, cutting off your nose to spite your face. Yeah. Number one. And number two, you know that Alabama is going to spam the rim and threes so much. And like, how much do you want your offense to operate in the mid range anyway, or to start in the mid range anyway? And I just don't, yeah. to me, that doesn't really seem yeah. like the way to go about it in this game. Yeah, so the, the math only works in that case. If UNC's defense is like on point in drop coverage. Right. And that's right. like, that, like right. it just, if not, it's tough because yeah, the like Alabama is just gonna be playing a more efficient brand of basketball mm -hmm. on, on both on both ends of the floor. Um how have you felt about Elliot Cadeau's freshman season? Have you have you seen a decent amount of him? I've seen a little bit of him, but I was not terribly familiar with him coming into the year. And mm -hmm. I never got he struck me as someone who was not he he wasn't playing selfishly or whatever he was trying to um operate within the team but it it seemed like too frequently he wasn't trying like his his buckets were not coming within the flow of their activity mm -hmm. that he was almost like a luxury and he's trying to create and do his thing and do what he knows how to do and that's how he thinks it's going to help his team that's the case for a lot of younger players both at the college and pro level they think I've got to be me. That's why I'm on the floor. That's why they wanted me. And it just ends up looking a little clunkier than it should. It's not really a reflection on him, just that he's on a more veteran team. And so it just was odd. Yeah. That's sort yeah. of what I thought of it. He he's a talent for sure. Um, and he, you know, he reclassed too. So like it does come like this freshman season, he, he's played well. Um, he's been like a winning player for them. Mm -hmm. I think his like I think he's done a decent job running the break, running the fast break, running the secondary break. Like he's got, I think in the open floor, his his vision sort of can like take off a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, he allows RJ to get off the ball, which is helpful. RJ is such a great catch and shoot guy, and you know, Hubert Davis has some really creative movement sets to shake him loose for threes. And Cadeau being on the ball helps them do that a little bit. Um, I think his drives have been important for them. He's not like a big time slasher, but he does give them, he can, on some games, he can help, you know, drive from 20 feet out and get the rim. Um, his lack of shooting is just like such a hindrance. And like, it's an obvious place to start, but for a five, 10, six foot guard to be like that much of a non shooter, it almost only works if you get to play next to a guy like RJ Davis, right? It's <laughs> just this like feathery, quick tip, quick, you know, quick trigger, um, you know, guard who can pull up off the dribble or off screens or on the break, like whatever. Um, but I'll be curious to see what Bama's coverage is for Cadeau because a lot of teams throughout the season have like played off of him, you know, given him sort of like the Mark Mitchell treatment. 
And he's countered that effectively at times. You know, sometimes he'll try to chew up the space with a drive, um, even if he's going into the defender against like a, a short closeout. They've used him to set flare screens for RJ Davis when, mm-hmm. when Baycott gets a post up, which good. It's just like sort of like basketball one on one with like yeah. half court offense with like a non shooter, you know, off the ball. Um, so they can problem solve around it a little bit, but just like I'll be curious to see like how Nate Oates treats him. Like that, I think that to me is like oh, if that, if I were Nate, I would matchup. I would leave him alone. That's yeah. I mean, like any. That's what I'm saying. Again, like the the with the math, if if you give Alabama, which is not a a really blessed defensive team, if you give <laughs> them an option to ignore, they will ignore it and yeah. say, you know, we are better off yeah. just letting him shoot and hoping he shoots and then we'll just rely on our offense to tilt the math on the other yeah. end yeah that that's why to me why seth trimble like is potentially a huge piece for unc in this game because like he's the first guard off the bench he's not much of a shooter either my guess is alabama would be like Shh, whatever <laughs> like we're not guarding you out there yeah. but like his defense could be important for unc and he gives a li- he's got a little bit more size um he can play on the ball a little bit not like Cadeau. But just like he might be a guy that I could see like needing to play like twenty minutes in this game or whatever, mm-hmm. you know, twenty plus minutes in this game, and like it, a positive impact being like required from him, um, on like a two way positive impact, like make a couple of shots and like play like you know twenty whatever minutes of like lights out defense because the spacing could get cramped a little bit with uh, with Kado off ball, um, and if you and see sort of like you know workarounds aren't working as well as they need them to. Yeah, I can see it. Yeah, makes sense. So you will. You said it's a toss up. You you want to make a pick? Yeah, I mean, I'll go. I'll go. You and see. in a in a in a close one. Like in a. I mean, like I'll I'll spare. I, I will not. Uh, I will not do the uh, the because this is getting said too many times. I will spare you the the track me. Uh, sure. Uh, you Thank know, you. Comp that's gonna be. Made. I already called a fireworks factory. I mean, we. That's are, we're, that, we're that's cool. Good. That's Thank that's you. unique. That's not the like oh track. I every time UNC plays Kentucky, everyone just immediately every sports writer's brains just like immediately default to being like it's going to be a track meet. So um, I also you know I, God now I don't want to do the podcast thing of like you know the thing about track meets like yeah. I just, <laughs> <laughs> just what's the deal with track meets? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Like I just, it's a dumb metaphor. It doesn't even imply that there's going to be a lot of offense, just that people are going to run a lot and people run yeah. a lot in every, every basketball game. Yes. Game. Yeah. But, yeah. Yeah. Virginia yeah. in like an inter-squad scrimmage is running a lot too. Like it's not, <laughs> it's one of the things that's like people have like, people have stopped thinking about like the genesis of the, of it. Right. So they just like, they say it because like, that's just a part of like the sports lexicon. Not yeah. because like it's like a great like comparison or whatever. Yeah, it's like saying someone's generational when they're like the best player in the last four years. Like it's not a, <laughs> not a not a generation, my man. Literally but, not a generation. <laughs> but anyway, yeah. Um, okay, I think like I come back to Baycott in that matchup, which is the reason I'm taking UNC. I am just not much of a Grant Nelson guy, and I don't think like. If he's going to be funneled into Baycott over and over and over again, I expect, I mean, I would hope that Baycott takes care of that because he has never really done it for me. I never really saw it with him this year. And I do think he's going to get kind of hacky and put Baycott at the line and put Alabama behind the eight ball, you know, from a free throw disparity perspective. But we'll see. Um, all, all, all season, I've like wanted him to shoot it better. Yeah, and, like, I mean, of is, course you would. In, but like, this is one of those games where you're like, God, the pick and pop is there against UNC with your yeah. five, and it's just like, if he, if but if he can't take and make that, like, what does it matter? Like, it's just like that is something that they they give up. It's default there, um, and it just doesn't seem like something that he'll really be able to like eat off of in this matchup. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. All right. Yeah. So let's go to you've mentioned uh, NC State a couple times. You know, obviously they were <laughs> they still are the toast of the ACC town on this little run that they're on. They're playing Marquette. Uh, <laughs> like NC State, for whatever your uh, team allegiance is, and I mean to the listener within the ACC, if you have one, 
Uh, very hard not to be ensorcelled by DJ Burns and uh, Horn and Diara and all like this motley crew of characters, you know, mm -hmm. Michael O'Connell not missing a three <laughs> in a big moment for the last it's for crazy. the last 18 days. It's crazy. <laughs> so like talk to me about them. Um, what has changed so drastically for them during this run and the matchup with uh the two seed Marquette? Yeah, I think I think a couple of things. One, like I think DJ Horn has gotten downhill more. Mm -hmm. And like he's Horn was great all season. Um, he was, yeah, he was great. He was great all season. Yeah, but a lot of it was looked early on. It felt like it looked a lot like his time in Arizona State. You know, come off screens, shoot in the mid range. Um, I think his aggression at times, like State's not a rim pressure team. They're they're never going to be with this offense. They really haven't been since Darion Sebron left town a couple of years ago, and but he gives them just a, just enough sort of like north south at times and with his shooting state also has two guys that can force defenses to put two on the ball and that's like a, that's a big deal like with burns in the post and with horn pick and rolls if he's got it rolling teams have to like adjust their coverage to consider those guys um state's a low turnover offense i actually think that's like the hallmark of the kevin keats era is like they he prints low turnover offenses. And that's mm. in part because like they run, they generally they run a ton of pick and roll. Now they run a lot of post ups with burns. Mm -hmm. There's not a lot of like movement. There's not a lot of passing. It's it can it can definitely get like bogged down and be predictable at times. Um, but it does keep the turnover rate down. And like that is also like what's propped up their offense for several years now. So low turnover rate on offense two guys that can force defenses to put two on the ball, whether it's in the post or horn on the perimeter, timely shot making from O'Connell and Jane Taylor. Um, and then the defense, which was pretty bad all season has just hit another, it's just hit another level. And like, I think they're doing that because they've got a couple of guards who can defend on ball O'Connell, Casey Morsell, who stepped up and had some big moments in the postseason. Um, DJ Horn is small, but not like a bad defender. And then mm, twitchy. Yeah. 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 He like he fights over screens. Like he, he tries. Um, they've had some worse defenders in the guard room. If there's a if you remember the Braxton Beverly era. Um <laughs> but uh that's not the case anymore. But um Mo Diara, who really like it's almost during this magical run for them, like it's been a part of it, but like he's fasting while observing Ramadan right now. And like, while doing that, he's morphed into like, I mean, he's been a great defender all season. I've been trying to like sing his praises since basically December when he took out Quentin Post in the Boston College matchup, the first Boston College matchup, but he's everywhere. He's a rebounding machine. I think he's top five nationally in defensive rebound rate. His rim protection yeah. has been great. Set an all-time ACC tournament rebounding record, didn't he? Like rebounded 60, 60, 60 rebounds. Yeah, <laughs> in a bunch, in a bu in five games, and a bunch were a bunch were on offense too. And oh, like Mo. the, yeah. the Mo Diara rebounds are not the like oh you know free throw got missed. I like half boxed out and it fell right to me. These are like out of area contested <laughs> rebounds in traffic, and it's like Jesus, how did he get to the ball? Had, uh, there was one play in the. It was either the Virginia or the UNC game where he went up for a board and it was like a surprise that he didn't come down with it, actually. And I just think his ability to switch when they need him to, to clean the glass, to give them some rim protection, which they need, especially when Burns is playing center because he gives them some help side rim protection. And the fact that just like he's taken on some tough assignments. He's taken on uh, Harrison Ingram. He's taken on Darian Williams from Texas Tech, who you and I both like quite a bit. He was yes, great against Williams in that game. He takes on Kyle Vilpowski. He takes on Chris Bell. Like, he's guarded some really, really, really good players throughout the season. But during this run, as their defense has hit another level, like, I think everyone sort of bought into it. But it's not, like, fluky. Uh, none of this has been fluky. It's just been this, like, simple formula. They've probably gotten some luck. Like, if Tony Bennett, like – 
ends the game, you know, call like strategizes differently down the stretch against NC State. Like O'Connell doesn't even get the chance to bank in that three to send it to overtime. Mm -hmm. But but State's defense has been much, much better. And Marcel gets credit for that. Taylor gets credit for that. O'Connell, but really it's 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 really Diara, um, who's really spearhead. Like he's just he's an excellent front court defender and a, a fantastic rebounder. So how do you expect them to approach Oso Igadara then? Where yeah. where is DR stationed? Where is Burns stationed? Yeah, it's tough because like I think they're gonna want to put Diara on Igadaro. Um mm-hmm. he's got the foot speed, the size to match up. Um, he could do he's pretty scheme versatile depending on how you want to handle the uh the, the pick and rolls and the handoffs and all of the rescreens with Kolek and, and Jones, Cam Jones, very talented, like really electric scoring guard um mm-hmm. for Mark. One of the best in the country. His his synergy page is like hilarious because it's just like he's just over a one point possession in everything. Like he's just had <laughs> he's had an awesome, uh, just a really awesome. I, I I like Cam Jones quite a bit and I've watched him a lot this past week and have been very impressed um, with what I've seen on film. Um, but I could also see them try to say like, well, we want Diara to be a helper. We'll put him on David Joplin. Who's no slouch. I mean, like David Joplin is like not mm-hmm. a guy like he big, you know, double digit score in the big East that can, you know, can handle a little, can step out and shoot. They use him to set screens too. It's like, he's not a hiding place. Um, neither is Ben Gold. I actually kind of like all of their front court room, but I would imagine they'll try Diara on 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 Oso um, and try to have him navigate that matchup and just keep Burns out of like the majority of those pick and roll possessions. That would be my guess. But I could also see them say like we'll put Burns on Oso and we'll just try to play drop coverage and like try to navigate the screens and like see if we can like get you know, Kolek and Oso to just take too many floaters and hopefully miss a bunch of them. But like, it's tough. It's a really, it's a really hard, like, I don't like the matchup for state's defense. Right. I just, yeah. it's not, it's not, it doesn't look great on paper. And, um, and like Marquette's pick and roll game is like pretty sophisticated. It's, you know, they come up, it's a, it's a pistol screen for Kolek. He gets a switch. Then Oso comes up and it's an empty side ball screen or it's a double drag pick and roll with an empty corner. Like they just do so many things and they're so fast that like it, I just state's just going to have to be like so locked in on that court on that end of the floor. And like they might, because they've been on a heater recently, but it's going to be hard. And just, it feels like for me, for them to do that, for them to get that effort, they need Diara to be the one that's like as involved in that as heavily as possible. Um, but so like, do you, th- sorry, go ahead. go ahead. I was just going to say, no matter what happens with state in this game though, like, like they already won the ACC. Like it's like all, like they made the sweet 16. Yeah. Like it's like, yeah. I, I they're, don't, like they're, they're the champs, baby. Like they want to yeah. keep, like, I know they want to keep winning and like, you don't want to just like go to like the, the moral victory thing, like already. Cause like they could definitely be Marquette. And then they get Duke again. Win. They're not scared. Yeah. They, yeah. But like the fact that they already like all of this is gravy for them, I guess is what I'm trying to say, because like, they they went and they settled for thirty seven years and then they did it by winning five in five days like it's it was insane it was what they did was insane it's nuts that they that they won the ACC tournament it's crazy yeah and beat Duke and UNC in route I mean like yeah. you know it's not as though the bracket fell their way no it's then, not yeah you know. so I think uh, do you think that Marcel uh, handles Kolek or how do they split the Kolek Cam defensive assignment it's tough. Um, they've got to, they at least have options, especially because they can bring Taylor in off the bench. Mm-hmm. Right. And, um, and hell, maybe that's something like they, to backtrack, they have not played four guards a ton this season. I don't think it's what they'll want to do against Marquette either. They went to it out of desperation in the final two minutes of overtime against Oakland because Diara and Middlebrooks both fouled out. Right. But like, can you get away with Casey Morcel or Jane Taylor on David Joplin? Maybe. So maybe, maybe they do dip into Diara plus four guards, but then you don't have burns for offense, but like, maybe that's a lineup we see occasionally for them. Some in this game you can see that. Um, Morcel, I bet they'll start with O'Connell on, on collect. That would be my guess. And then Morcel gets the, the Jones matchup, but like they do so many early offense pistol, you know, pistol action guard guard screens and handoffs that like those guys are going to be switching. Like state is a, you know, 
it's a little different now with with Diara because they don't he's not like an auto switch guy though he can switch but like one through three they're switching they're gonna switch everything like when there's an exchange oh, like right. that so like I would think these these things are gonna get scrambled around they're probably hoping like hey if we've got like Horn or if, if he's on the bench Taylor that like they're like we're happy with any of these guys trying to handle you know trying to like try, like being able being willing to like navigate the screen once they get switched on to collect because like you're going to get those kinds of like double barrel, you know, pick and rolls from, uh, from Mar from Marquette. Yeah. I think your, uh, your hint that they could go DR plus four guards. I think that they should do that a lot in yeah. this game. Cause as much as I love Burns and I, who doesn't like you can't putting him in pick and roll. <laughs> I just with Kolek, <laughs> Yeah. He's another guy who is, I mean, he's a different player than McCain, but the same weakness for Kolek is generating the space in the first place. Once he gets into space, he's very comfortable and will pick you apart. Absolutely. Yeah. And he like Burns isn't going to deter him from doing anything. What if, if he's the guy that he has to engage? So I, I would think that, in order to both maximize your offense against a, a, a talented offensive team to play five out as much as you possibly can, you would do Diara and four guards a lot. And when Burns is in the game, have him go right at Oso and see if yeah. he can get Oso to foul him and like, yeah. and yeah. see what, see what you can gin up there. I mean, again, yeah. we like to talk about these games as if, these teams are so predictable and you can just understand what kind of performance they're going to turn in, but it is, it is March and it is college basketball. Yeah. So there's a lot like the game script could be wild in any one of these games. Mm -hmm. And I wouldn't, I think that it would take a, a really great defensive effort from NC state's guards to bother these guys on Marquette, mm -hmm. but it's not as though, I mean, Marquette acted like, you know, after beating Colorado in a really good game, like a very high quality. Awesome. One of my favorite games of the tournament. Right. I agree. Really good bell to bell game, but they acted like they won the national title. It's not yeah. as though they are <laughs> ready and raring to just like steamroll their way to the final four. So like, I, I think there will be an opportunity there if he's pushes the right buttons mm -hmm. and, and I think goes to that alignment. That's what I would like to see. And if Burns can win that matchup with Oso on his preferred side of the floor on offense, then that's, they might have something, but how do you expect Oso to be able to D him up? Yeah. Like that's the, so I am fascinated to see because like Marquette almost to their detriment, sometimes they are so aggressive defensively. It's like a it, shock it's, a team, so, baby. I mean, I mean, it is, it is wild to watch them play. Cause it's like, all right, full court press. And then let's fall back to this defense where we're switching everything and we double every post touch. And it's just like, well, there's a lot of moving parts happening at the same time. Like, it's just, it's wild to see. And like oh, so many of these, like these, like, you know, they're, they're switching up the line on pin downs and sometimes like they don't even need to switch. And like the guy who like was going to be coming off the pin, just sort of like fades to the corner. And it's like, all of a sudden no one's guarding him because they switched for no reason. Um, so like they're crazy. They're it's a crazy watch, and like they, oh, I do man. think for the most part, like they're bought in on that end. But like, it, oh, they're got, definitely bought in. You know, they and, just, and I, got, I don't know, they know, I don't know that they know yeah. what they bought, but they yeah. bought it. Yeah, and, and, and Oso's everywhere, and they've got you know Mitchell and um Ross. And, you know, they've got some like interesting um in Norman who plays, you know, a little more of like back end of the rotation guy, but like they've got some like interesting guard defenders on the roster too. But just so it's like, are they going to switch Oso? And if so, if he if DJ Burns sets a screen for Michael O'Connell, is Mark is Marquette just switching that? Like what are they like like and they think they, you know they'll hedge with Oso sometimes, sometimes he's in the drop. So like maybe that maybe they'll switch less. Or maybe they'll say, no, we F it. We're going to switch, throw it into the paint. We're going to double. And, but like Burns throughout this season, It'll get him comfy. Yeah. Rush. Cause like when, when all of a sudden, when you double him, that's how stake gets the rim in the half court. And that's how stake mm -hmm. gets kick out threes. Mm -hmm. That's like the best way for them to generate that stuff. So like, does Marquette just say like, no, we're going to do our thing. And like, 
it has been interesting. Like I went back and watched their games this week against uh, like one of the games against Providence who you've got uh, Adoro, who's a, you know, post up guy for them. Um, I watched one of their games against Villanova. So you've got Eric Dixon, who's another sort of like, I mean, he's a little bit more like stretch, but another guy that like plays with his back to the basket, the team that initiates from the post a lot. They doubled the post a lot in those games. It's almost an automatic thing. And they're like, they're, they're doing it to like get the ball out of the, like to like get a turnover. You're right. It's not just to right. see like, it's not just this, it, like they're really doing it to like force a turnover so they can get out and run. Um, so I'll be curious to see how much they switch pick and roll when Burns is in. And I'll be curious to see like when that happens, what the post doubles look like and, um, what this sort of similar to when we were talking about Duke moving off the ball when they're, when they get into like these pockets of space, like, I think the way you beat Marquette's rotations, cause like sometimes they're really good at like flying around and Xing out and like they hit their spots but like, can you continue to move off the ball when there's been a ball screen into a post up and now Burns has it and the double's coming, like and they're flying around, like, can you get one more in smart cut so that Burns can, you know, you get Jane Taylor on a vertical cut coming down the gut of the lane or you get uh, Mo DR sliding around the dunker spot. Or Horn, um, you know, Horn's yeah, done that yeah, too. Right. And like, yeah. he, he tends to be the guy, like, it's, he's the guy that if you don't commit resources, to him and I don't I don't know if Marquette will because like they're so like dead set I'm just like amping up pressure yeah that, like I'm not sure if they're gonna be like hey we have to be conscious of like when we help like it's not off him you know what I mean like that kind of stuff I I think it's similar to what you said about Houston and the Duke matchup like Marquette does not and and this just is always who Shaka has been they I I would imagine that they do double because. Yeah. Shaka is more concerned about them being themselves. I think he will, <laughs> I, it's like an overthinking thing, yeah. but he will say to himself, if we change the way we play, then we are going to play tight. And I don't want us to play tight. I want us to play loose and free and loose and free is this insanity. And so that's how they're going to play. And it's <laughs> yeah. like, and in the big East, that's one thing because there are not many bigs in the, I mean, no one really plays like Burns, Burns but there yeah. are not many bigs in the big East that operate as a hub in that manner. You get a lot of defensively tilted bigs mm -hmm. in the big East who are very talented, but not ones who are going to punish a double as instantaneous, who will like be yeah. so happy to see a double team the way that uh yeah. that DJ Burns will. So yeah. there I think there is a path there. It's like it it should be in Marquette's hands to shut off that water and to not yeah. put themselves in that position, but I agree with you. I think they will. They it, will it give just, it a whirl. And there's going to be somebody there there's a chance depending on how like Marquette wants to handle things where it's like they might be double teaming Burns in the post, but it might be with like the double team might be like Tyler Kulik and like Cam Jones <laughs> or like, or like Mitchell, yeah. so, you know, it could be in like, it, like seriously, like, cause they're going to switch and just like the extra defender is often a guard coming down, you know, from like yeah. one pass away to, to help. And it's just like, yeah, you could, there could be some possession where it's like DJ Burns just like scanning over the top of two, six, three guys to pick out a cutter or to like skip it to DJ Horn. Like yeah. that I went to see Tyler Kulik you know, take a charge immediately <laughs> off a, off a, or like try to draw a charge off it, of DJ Burns. It will be, it would be fitting for that to happen. Um, and I mean, like that was definitely part of like uh, a cup, like Texas tech, their game plan was like, Oh, we're going to try to guard him one-on-one. -on -one, and like the second he tries to back us down, like for like the second time he tries to put a shoulder in, like, we're just going to go down. And like, they got two offensive fouls in that game um, off of that. Like what's interesting is that like, State has proven that they can win with like Middlebrooks being like the guy at center. So, look, I think Middlebrooks off the bench could be an important guy, including like Middlebrooks plus like four guard type lineups as well. But ultimately, like they, you know, they're going to need some offense out of Burns in this game. The passing, yeah. the yeah. the mid post scoring, the the foul generation, and just like, yeah, Marquette is a crazy team, and I'm I'm fascinated to see like how chaotic they are like mm. against the state offense, which is like low turnover, pretty methodical. Like we play through a couple of these guys 
and like yeah who sort of like wins that tug of war um between like you know the post-ups turnover creation and the coverages that marquette's going to deploy okay all right let's go to our and you're taking marquette i would imagine yeah, the, like take, all, with all of that yeah yeah I, take, I just think i just don't like they have more strings to, to pull at than than state does the, the state's do. not without any like they've got some 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 chips to play just like more stuff has to go right for state i think to for them to win this game i think marquette just has a you know large more margin for error i i probably agree but if we agree on the last one i'll just switch and take nc state because i like <laughs> okay. i perfect the way that we did not talked about it was so entertaining in my mind yeah. about how it gets <laughs> seen a game play out that way that i <laughs> yeah. would just take nc state yeah. all right so yeah. uh clemson arizona um clemson was so uninspiring at the end of the regular season <laughs> and the ACC tournament. Yeah. And yeah. then, you know, they play New Mexico. And I really should have seen coming that they were going to win that game, just given how young New Mexico is and how small they are and how built Clemson is to, like, leverage that against them. But regardless, they took care of business, and then they really clamped down um, Baylor – who I thought was a susceptible, a susceptible team to doing that. Um, but now they play a team that can match them in size for sure uh, in Arizona and that can, you know, Arizona prides itself both on its ability to just straight up shot make between Boswell and Caleb Love mm -hmm. and Pella Larson, but also to have sort of a high pass ping, ping, ping offense and just sort of hit their flow as well. So how do you expect, I mean, Clemson's calling card in the tournament has been their defense. How do you expect Arizona to test their defense and how do you see that matchup um, tilting? Yeah, I think I really like Clemson's front court room a lot. Um, we'll start there. I mm -hmm. think PJ Hall's awesome. Ian Shefflin has had like flew under the radar having an awesome, awesome season on the glass, stepping out and shooting, can handle a little bit. And RJ Godfrey off the bench is like a great backup, you know, four or five for them too. Um Arizona's just like power and athleticism and like grace are just like such a <laughs> tough sell. I yeah, I didn't mention uh Keyshaw Johnson, who's yeah, probably he, their best NBA prospect. Yeah. yeah. And like, I mean, it's going to be fascinating to see him. I mean, I imagine he and Hall, that's like, that's going to be like a hell of a matchup mm -hmm. in, in, within this game. Um, Clemson is, they're an interesting defense because they've got, like, they've got a decent, like, on ball lead defender uh, with Hunter. Um, Chauncey Wiggins is pretty skinny, but I kind of like him as like an under the radar three and D guy in the ACC going back to last season. Um, he's got to get stronger, but he's got, there's, there might be something there. And Jack Clark gives them some room, you know, some versatility there as well. Um, Brad Burnell knows how to like defend Caleb Love. Um, and I'll be curious to see like uh, Clemson is one of those teams that I think if you haven't watched a lot of the ACC, they're, they're like, there's some like Virginia to them in terms of like, how grabby they are like off ball and how physical mm -hmm. they are. And they're going to try to like make the ref make decisions like that type of things, you know, whether they're going to call the hand check or call the, the hold or like, like they, they, they will junk the game up that way a little bit. Um, and so I'll be very curious to see like how physical they are with love and like what that means for his production, because like, Love was amazing this season and it, you know, it's very cool that he had this kind of year, but the shot, the, like, you know, going back to this time at UNC, the, the shot selection, not always amazing. Mm -hmm. um, the, the dribble drive game at time, like, you know, throughout his time at UNC was, a, he had moments, but, you know, he really struggled to finish in a lot of like downhill drive situations in the half court. Um, and so I will be very curious to see a Clemson defense that's going to try to gap up you know, they're going to uh, be, they're going to ice screens. They're going to, they're going to drop. Um, and then they're going to be physical with the, your guards on the perimeter. And so I don't know, just like, can you stuff some of Arizona's guards into a phone booth and make them take tough shots? Um, 
And can you keep some of their front court power off the offensive glass? And, and, and Clemson's got two good, you know, Hall and, and, and Shefflin um, are very, you know, they're very good rebounders and, and they're guys that can, that can take care of the glass a little bit and Godfrey can come give them and give them some more athleticism up front. Um, so it's a tough assignment for them, um, especially to deal with like Arizona's pace, but Clemson does stuff to sort of like artificially like deflate pace too, because like they're pretty methodical offensively and like they're something to prepare for because they got fours and fives that can shoot. They play out of the high post a lot. Like they run sets like they, they are like Clemson is a like either secondary break and they flow into continuity ball screen offense or like they're running sets every, every time they got a guy with a whiteboard out there with, scribbles on it to run a set every every time down the court and with a guy like hall who's such who's such like a matchup problem you know i i think there's a chance that like clemson can like create a couple of pressure points against arizona's defense which is a great defense um i do sort of worry about them like stopping arizona unless they're able to just like drag the game into the mud you know like it does feel like they've got to be able to like get it to a different place and sort of like get it at from be, get it to being like a grindier game, um, and if they can't do that, then they're in, they're probably in some trouble on that end. Okay, yeah, I don't have a great feel for this game. I I have watched I watched Clemson early in the year when they started out nine and zero. I watched mm-hmm. them more then than I did through ACC play, but I've watched a lot of Arizona, and w- what I am confident about Arizona is that. If if the game defensively unfolds in this sort of junky manner, like you're talking about, those guards, I mean, Boswell's not, he can get into the paint, but he is not like a rim pressure guy to begin with. Love will, I mean, he'll get to the rim if it's available to him, but if the option to take a pull up 20 footers there, then he'll take a pull of 20 footer. <laughs> yeah, it's going and on. Larson for as much, you know, he's a fascinating prospect like pro prospect Pella is because the efficiency is so good, but he is so choosy, overly choosy, especially given his age, in my opinion, mm-hmm. that I could see him sort of <clears throat> his shot selection being dictated by the tempo of the game and how much he's getting grabbed and that sort of thing as well. I could see all three of those guys settling for less than ideal shots around the perimeter as they try to manufacture separation and they get a little bit frustrated. Now that takes them getting frustrated and it takes Balo not being able to establish himself and all of that stuff. I think the vast majority of scripts here would come out in Arizona's favor. Mm -hmm. Um, Especially because I think Hall need (laughs) whose shot had dried up over the course of the season after a scorching start from three, I think he would have to have a very good game off the bat offensively to at least Mm -hmm. like keep Clemson in it through the first half and everything so that Arizona could tight tighten up in the second half and start to take some of these ill-advised shots. But I could see all three of those guards succumbing to the sort of voodoo that Clemson's going to try to put on them. I wouldn't take Clemson necessarily, but I have seen tournament games like that where it just it gets it's not unlike how it would have unfolded against Baylor. Arizona has better personnel than than Baylor does, but it just takes like one bricky half you know that's that's all it really takes and i could see that happening in this game yeah i think um clemson has this interesting thing where i know i know hall like he cooled off after this great start but like teams still have to guard him you know Mm -hmm. he's still a threat spotting up pick and pop that type of stuff shefflin doesn't take a ton of threes but 21 to 42 this season from deep (laughs) not not bad at uh at 50 percent and you could see in the Arizona Dayton game, Holmes. I mean, he played. Holmes was great in that game because I thought it was one of the better like prospect games of the tournament. But with Ballo and drop coverage, and some of the stuff that like Dayton could get off that with Holmes picking and popping, like I'll be curious to see like what things look like for Shefflin, um, in terms of like his ability to like do damage in space. 
whether that's like pick and pops or Clemson runs a lot of stuff. Like they've got like, you know, they're going to run some chin offense. They've got some, you know, chin point series stuff. So just like front court initiation. And I'm curious to see how, like, how with these sort of like quasi or, or legit five out looks, um, like how they're, how those, how Balo handles that. Cause he's going to want to sink and drop into the paint. Mm -hmm. well, then what does that mean for the guys coming off the handle? Like in, there's some strengths to that because like that, that takes away some of the cutters that Clemson would look for on some of these looks, but then the handoffs might be there. Um, Joe Girard is not my cup of tea necessarily as far as uh, AC nor mine. Nor my, yeah. Who's it's, it's a very small group of people. He is a dangerous shooter and he's very good coming off screens. And if Clemson knows you're going to be in drop coverage, Sort of similar to how I was talking about, like, um, I think it was Alabama earlier, like taking advantage of like using movement sets to go at drop coverage. Gerard is someone you can do that with too. They use throwback actions, you know, Iverson screens into another screening action. Like they've got a lot of creative set pieces for him to get to shake loose for threes. So, sort of similar, like one of the things that could like, that could like, you know, really like uh, mess up the script. Cause I agree, like Arizona should win this game. They're a better team. They're awesome. Um, I'm a, very impressed with them throughout the season. I saw them up close at Duke in November. Um, but just like someone does have to chase him around screens. Like he, he is someone to like account for in this game. And obviously like Arizona's got great depth in the guard room. Um you know, Lewis, Bradley. I mean, they've got so many mm -hmm. guys they can that they can use to one of those guys can be just committed to like trying to like chase this guy off screens and stuff like that. But that is something that like I do like every Clemson game, it for me it always starts with like the high post initiation and like, you know, the pick and pop stuff with Hall and Shefflin. Shefflin on the offensive glass too is a monster. Um one of the better offensive rebounders in the country. But then just sort of like they use Gerard like his movement is really crucial to their offense. And so like, if he has a two for nine game, then Clemson's toast. If he can make four or five threes, and if he makes a couple in a row, like he he's the one like wild card for me for Clemson in this game, because his movement shooting could just be um, a ceiling raiser for them offensively. Okay. Yeah. I think a very good point. I think the pick and pop, with Shefflin. Yeah. Like it's again, how, how does the first 10 minutes of the game look? If Arizona is up 10, then it's going to be hard for Clemson to walk them down. Yeah. If those <laughs> first few threes go in and this is, you know, 17 to 17 with five minutes left in the first half, and it's just gross, then you can see it going another way. I, I'll take Arizona um, for the reasons that we've talked about. And <clears throat> Seriously, the this Keisha Johnson, a fascinating NBA prospect. I won't dwell on him in this episode because um he's not an ACC guy, but yeah. <laughs> he was on San Diego State's team last year. They got to the national title game. He is, despite being older, I think he turns 23 in June, 22 this year. Mm -hmm. He uh is one of the best wings, or pardon me, one of the best athletes on the wing in the country. Has yes. almost 50 dunks this year and has gotten increasingly comfortable uh, with his three-point shot. I think he's like 36 of 90, like right around 40%. Yep. Mm -hmm. And he, I expect him to like guard PJ Hall pretty well. Like he will obviously get that assignment. He certainly has the movement skills to do it. He's, he's a, for it. a really like good pounding switcher on the guards when that matchup presents itself like key shot is really good and i think his um his versatility uh and his like that's just that is a brand of wing athlete that is not around much in the acc in the same way yeah. a dj burns you know post initiator <laughs> is not around yeah. much in the big east yeah. so yeah with everything that Arizona can throw at him, I will take Arizona. But that means that I'm going to take NC State over Marquette. Right, so I this is it. really this has ended up it. really great. I, yeah. I love it. You picked you picked my alma mater, NC State, to, <laughs> to, to beat Marquette. I appreciate it. I've gone against the uh 
than against the degree here. Yeah, well, Keyshot is amazing. I like when they played at Duke in November, seeing him warm up was eye opening. He is absolutely like the the first off the bus kind of guy, you know, where you're like, <laughs> oh, whoa, look at that guy. And like, I mean, just, you yeah. know, windmill dunks, just like, like a six, seven, 230 pound guy just sort of like floating through the air with power. Mm -hmm. He's, yeah, he's an amazing athlete. He was like one of the most, he was maybe the most like striking guy I saw in person, like from like a physical athletic standpoint this year at, uh, at Duke. And there were like plenty of guys that were great players that came through there this season. But to your point about there, like not being a guy quite like that somewhere else in the ACC, like that it's highlighted by the fact that like, I really can't like Ryan Dunn is sort of like striking athletically in, in a, an impressive way, but like, yes. Yeah. Not, not, but not, like, not, not, not like this. Oh, he's not yoked up the way that Keyshot so in, is yoked up. And obviously, you know, Keyshot, I mean, he's, he's older. Although he's not that much older than Dunn, even though he's played much more college basketball. But yeah. Dunn's, his lack of offense is just like it. Yeah, it, we is. don't, yeah. That would be such a bummer note to end. This. Yeah, let's just forget. We can cut, <laughs> that, cut that. We <laughs> talked about Ryan in that episode. We brought him yeah. up in that episode. And I was like, really good 2025 prospect yeah. and the sit and the Tyrese Proctor thing happened. And it's like Ryan Dunn, you know, going, being drafted 11th to Chicago. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Fellas, <laughs> yeah. this poor kid. Like I yeah. watched him play my alma mater, uh, Wake Forest. Yeah. And he, that was the game that Virginia won 49, 47, where they went one of 11 from the was, free throw. That line. was a brutal game. And won the game, which Brutal was game. great as a as a fan of the losing team to watch that <laughs> one on a Saturday afternoon. But Ryan <clears throat> missed a three down the stretch in that game when no one was hitting anything. Like he airballed a three, yeah. but it was an open three. Like he got the ball. It was a catch and shoot look. I don't think there was that much time left on the shot clock. Mm -hmm. And he shot it and it was an air ball and a miss. And he turned to his teammates and he's like, that's my fault. I shouldn't have shot it. You guys yeah. are right. Like, what yeah. was I thinking? Yeah. And I was like, you're yeah. going to be a pro next pro? year. Yeah. <laughs> you're going to be in the NBA. <laughs> yeah. And this is yeah. how you, like, yeah. I, I just yeah. can't with him. And I, I don't, I don't want to make it sound like I don't like what is so special about him. Cause I obviously do, but like the NBA is an offensive league, man. Like yeah. you. Yeah. Uh, to be, it, to be, to be that much of a, this is not like castle from UConn, right? Who's no, like, no, no, who no. Who can do like, I've been like, I love him and another amazing defender. Like he's playable on offense with a shaky jumper. Ryan Dunn Correct. is like such a, a negative shooting wise it's like he needs something has to change because like as it currently constituted like this is not viable um he has done is interesting to watch during warm-ups because he he shoots naturally in warm-ups it i do think there is like some sort of like psychological thing with him now yeah. because like sure it, it's just like you put him in a game and even when teams aren't guarding him it, you know, all of a sudden his, his, like his form, his process, it looks okay. Sometimes he'll have other games where no one's on him and he's like doing a like McGrady fadeaway right. jumper. And it's like, this has got to, this is a mess, honestly. Like we got to do something about this. So um, I get him as like a, a, a bet guy just because the defense is so special. And if you can give him a year to like work on the offense, but like, yeah, there's just a lot of work to do. A lot. a lot of, there's just a lot there's just a lot and, it, and it's and like the again this is a draft thing but when someone's like oh get him you know the pels can take him fred vinson fred vinson <laughs> and it's like yeah. okay yeah fred vinson has done great work with herb jones who was <laughs> the sec player of the year yeah right, for a right. two seed his senior year mm -hmm. so like you, and who was operating pick and roll at six yeah. eight and yeah. having these crazy passes and just cramming off one on on like one foot on drives all the time like it's it's not you take a nothing shooter and turn him yeah. into an average NBA shooter it's you take a like an okay college shooter yeah. an, and then turn him into something that is yeah. NBA viable. Like you yeah. have to have some sort of base. Base like because oh. all Dunn's offense has been this season has been putbacks. The transition stuff is freaky and looks cool, but like it's not doing it not enough. 
No. And then it's like, it's like, you know, empty side dives out of blocker mover. You know what I mean? Like, and just like occasionally gets like a cut, you know, a cut dunk off of a Reese Beekman fine, but it's like, that's, that's, that's almost nothing. You know what I mean? Yeah. Like, like yeah. that's, that's with teams basically ignoring him, which you knew what was going to, you knew that was going to happen at some point this season and teams started to like really dial it up this year. And um, yeah, I mean, I'm not all the way off the board. I'm not all the way off on him again because of the defense but but you know what i'm just glad we got to blocker mover i'm glad that (laughs) somehow had to sneak it in there (laughs) had to i almost said that it was seven minutes in the into the podcast before you mentioned reese's name i saw your face smile i was like like, ah "Ah, i got it in there (laughs) i did it (laughs) so okay so you're taking uh chalk right you're taking the favorite in each matchup here houston unc Marquette and Arizona. I'll take yeah. NC State in your honor, Brian. Um, I originally, when we were going to schedule this episode, I was looking forward to talking about UConn's prospects because we're both obviously so high on UConn. But yeah. if there's time next week, assuming they take care of business, we'll might maybe get into yeah. that. But I'd love to do that. Yeah. A, another year where the ACC can't, you know, they it's crazy man had another good one so and brian you had another great one thank you so much for joining um let's enjoy the sweet 16 thank you all very much for listening this has been chucking darts it's okay to be wrong about sports find (laughs) your dartboard and start chucking thank you